Welcome to Perceptions Today podcast, where we discuss consciousness in all forms. May 2022, episode 26, Krista de Mayo joins us in a roundtable about lucid dreaming, part one of three. Krista de Mayo is an independent researcher of lucid dreaming, myths, plants, and much more. With when you're watching these things, is it like watching a film kind of dispassionate as an observer, seeing the events that actually happen? I wanted in the beginning, but now I have like, oh my God, it's, it's a lot. It's, uh, I'm there. I'm there. So it's, it's not a, a, the POV as a gamer is in it. You know, I'm just in the middle of these situations. Um, and they wake, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a lot in it. I mean, there's quite a lot interesting to that point of view. Krista might actually know something. Obviously, Gabe looks like he's got something to actually add to this. So we go to Krista first and then come back to Gabe. But it'd be interesting to see with the way that you're feeling about it. This is an instance of the conversation coming up in the roundtable discussion. Participants knew it was being recorded. Welcome to Perceptions Today. It's 2022, February the 8th, Twitter Space Chat number 20, discussing lucid dreaming with Krista DeMaio. I'm your host, Perceptions Today, known as Paul, and your co-host is Central Awareness, but due to unfortunate circumstances, she can't be here. On the 8th of March, we have Aaron Voot doing a Twitter space, and also on the 22nd of March, we have Mike Ferrito doing the same. And then we have other things that were booked in for other dates. We've also got a new mailing list, which is in the bio link, which is in Linktree. So that's L-I-N-K-T-R dot double E forward slash perceptions full stop today. And in there, you've got the mailing list, directly contact and also the list of events that are coming up and what i will now say to chris Mayo, over to you for discussing lucid dreaming okay thanks paul and thanks for everybody showing up um i'm gonna um just kind of go over um, my journey with lucid dreaming and i have kind of different sections of talk so we'll do questions throughout this um but what i may do is um, if you have a question that's going to be about something I, I will talk about later on in the in the space, then I'll just kind of boot you down for that. So um, I won't intentionally not answer your question, but it, I might just put it into more uh, context for the conversation. We can't use that, that language of booting them down. We'll take notice of them later. We're not that violent in <laughs> okay, here. Okay. There's only so violent you can get with this. So. Um, so again, thanks for everybody for showing up and listening. And... Um, Again, my name's Krista, and I uh, have been on a pretty active lucid dream journey, is how I call it. Um, it's been a practice for a little over a year now, and um, it, it's, it, it is kind of an interesting connection. How I was introduced to this community of perceptions today was um, I was um, introduced to Anthony Peake and uh, joined in on one of the uh, earlier talks back in October and listened to him. And um, With Anthony Peake, I was introduced to a guy named Dave Green, who is a, um, an active lucid dreamer in the UK. Uh, and I um, connected with Dave uh, a year ago when I was just beginning my lucid dream journey. And I, uh, I, I wanted to connect with him because he does something pretty interesting. He's been a lifelong lucid dreamer, but... Due to the pandemic, um, he uh, kind of dove into it a little bit more. And what he does and what he did for Anthony and what he did for me is that he um, draws lucid dreaming portraits. So what he does is he meets with you, um, you know, via Zoom and talks with you and kind of gets to know you a little bit. And then he actively uh, uh, tries to lucid dream about you. And he holds a piece of paper up in his dream uh, over your face and he draws what he sees. And then in the waking world, he wakes up and he draws that same image. So he kind of pulls a portrait of you out of his own uh, dream world and then he mails it to you. And so he was on a uh, an Anthony Peake um, YouTube episode and I got introduced to him from that. So it's just a nice way to for me, kind of full circle, weave Dave Green into perceptions today because Anthony Peak kind of wove me into it too. So with that, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and just talk about how I um, got to the point that I'm at uh, today, February 2022. I can confidently say that I am a lucid dreamer because I've spent um, over a year um, doing a, a, a daily practice of working with uh, my dreams and my, 
my uh, dream world. Um, I do things in the dreams and I do things for my dreams during the day. And uh, I wanted to sh- kind of share that with people because, you know, I'm not an author. I, I don't have a dreaming business that I'm trying to promote. This is not a monetized adventure. This has been a, um, a, a practice for my own just, you know, insight and my own spiritual growth. And I feel like uh, it's, it's free for anybody to do, and there are a ton of benefits to it. And I wanted to, you know, I, I, I feel like I can sometimes be annoying about the people around me because I talk about dreams so much, but it's incredibly empowering and exciting. And so I'm glad to have a larger platform with people that aren't sick of hearing me talk about dreams <laughs> yet. So, um, as a little foundation of, of, of who I am, um, I, uh, I live in the States, I live in North Carolina, and um, I'm a photographer, so I, I am a pretty visual person. Uh, I appreciate uh, visual things, and my dreams have always been incredibly vivid visually. I usually don't activate any other senses in my dreams. Um, I, you know, with this past year, have read a lot of books about dreams and dream theory and why we, why we dream at all and what it means when we dream about certain things. And there are some people, I think it's like about 10% of people will dream about smells and other senses like touch, but usually dreams are mostly visual um, with some uh, audio in there. But I have always been a very vivid dreamer. And uh, I think that that has helped me become a lucid dreamer because my dreams are already pretty wild, pretty vivid, pretty bright, very active. And uh, as a kid, I was a, a active dreamer. And also that meant I had a lot of nightmares. I had uh, uh, apocalyptic nightmares. I had um, sleep paralysis, um, which I understand now they call old hag syndrome, which is when you wake up and you can't move any muscle of your body, you feel like you're um, kind of trapped between worlds. And as a kid, I thought that I I thought it was a demon. Uh, I thought it was some sort of ghost that had crawled out of the dream world and through me and was now in the waking world. And it was terrifying. Um, I, I don't really have those anymore. I've had a few as an adult, but for the most part, they happened when I was a child. And, uh, a lot of people have probably had lucid dreams before when they were kids. They just don't remember them very well. If you remember dreams that you had when you were a kid, chances are they may have been a lucid dream because most people have the experience of lucid dreaming. I think it kind of fades away when you're like eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, some people, uh, of course, still carry it on into adulthood. But uh, if you have a dream where it, it seemed realer than real, um, it seemed like more lifelike than even real life. Chances are that that could have been a lucid dream, even if you weren't in control of the dream, which most people associate lucid dreams with your calling the shots across the board. That isn't always the case in a lucid dream. Sometimes it's just uh, an incredibly saturated uh, experience. So you you feel emotional, you feel that the dream has, you know, so much importance and and weight and symbolism the colors are almost pulsing Uh, that's the chances are that that was a lucid dream so I had a lot of those as a kid Um, I still remember lots of them and I also did something that I feel like is key if you want to bring lucid dreaming into your life now which is I um, I always wrote my dreams down I journaled as a kid I still journal now as an adult And I think that that has helped me kind of keep track of and have an active dream world. So uh, those two things, already being a dreamer and writing them down, uh, really helped uh, create a solid foundation of of the dreams for me. So fast forward uh, a couple of decades to last year, January 21. I um, did what's called dry January. So I just abstained from all alcohol. And I did it for health reasons. I have congestive heart failure and I have to be mindful of uh, 
my diet and making sure I don't have too much salt and I exercise and have plenty of fluid. And uh, I was diagnosed a few years ago and I've been working with doing whatever I can to help um, manage my disease. And one of the next obvious things was to reduce alcohol because it's a highly inflammatory substance that we consume. So I, I just did it for a month thinking, oh, I'll give up alcohol and that'll help, help me with my heart health. <clears throat> what I didn't really consider was that, um, and it's obvious now looking back on it, when you don't consume alcohol, you have a pretty clear head when you go to sleep and you even more so have a clear head when you wake up. And because of that, because of that choice of not consuming alcohol, my dreams just got very, very wild. And uh, I decided to just keep it up, mainly because I didn't miss alcohol. It, the novelty was kind of over for me. And I liked the feeling of, um, of having a clear head in the morning. Not like I was, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't get wasted. I, I, I wouldn't say that I was an alcoholic, but it was enough where I was depending on it at night to help me go to sleep. And breaking away from that was uh, one of the best choices that I ever made. At the same month that I gave up alcohol, I um, read a book, and I'll pin this book here. Uh, it is uh, by Andrew Holacek, and he is a, coming from a Tibetan Buddhist foundation. He studied under Rinpoche, and in, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, they have a thousand-year-old, over a thousand-year-old plus tradition of uh, of what they call dream yoga. And it's essentially lucid dreaming, what we would call lucid dreaming. So there's a, a very deep foundation within the spiritual practice of Tibetan Buddhism where they, they practice mindfulness um, and like kind of mind yoga, dream yoga while they're asleep. And it, it was a really sweet way to be introduced to the subject of lucid dreaming uh, through through his filter because he writes he writes really beautifully and because he's talking in kind of story form the the lessons that he teaches they stick with you longer instead of it just being facts um, I have read other books that were equally as interesting but the information didn't stay and I think because they are just were just factual there was one I'll pin that one in a second it's by Matthew Walker it's called Why We Sleep. And his was more about um, why, like, w what the importance of sleep is and what that does to the body systems. But Andrew Holacek's book, Dream Yoga, I read the same month that I started this practice. And that, in, in tandem with uh, sobriety, was just a really serendipitous pairing uh, to dive into, uh, dive into this practice. Also, that same month is when I met with Dave Green. And just had a, uh, I felt like I had a lifeline to a very uh, successful lucid dreamer where I could ask any questions. And Dave is funny. He's, he's a stand-up comedian first. And so he was just very engaging. And uh, I uh, celebrated my first lucid dream by like messaging him on Instagram as soon as I had it. Cause I, I knew that he would appreciate how, uh, how, like momentous it was after, after trying for so long. So what lucid dreaming is, is becoming aware that you're dreaming while you're still asleep. Some call it like a uh, meta consciousness, like being aware of your awareness while you're still asleep. And uh, in Western culture, you know, it's been in the last 50, 60 years that scientifically we have accepted that that actually happens before that, it was kind of a scientific uh, uh, denial that you can't be conscious while you're asleep because you're asleep. How, how is that even supposed to work? And Stephen LaBerge, um, his book, Exploring the World of Lucid Dreaming, is one of the first um, bigger publications that came out that showed scientific evidence that this actually happens. Um, so the fact that it works, um, you know, I mean, individuals' experiences with it uh, are proof in itself uh, and my experience with it has been a lot of fun. I mean, that's the, the, the big draw of continuing to do it is that it is uh, a lot of fun. 
Um, with that, I, th I guess I'll pause and see if there's any questions just about um, the origins of this. And then, um, you know, I, I'll go into uh, how, like what, what the other benefits of lucid dreaming are, and then we can kind of go on from there. Does that sound good? Yeah, that's a great introduction. And also just looking for hands up. Excellent. Mike. Hey there, Krista. Uh, and hey there, Paul. Uh, great, great summary. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, got into to lucid dreaming. Had you ever read Patricia Garfield? Um, I haven't, but I'm aware of her. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was the first one I read. And it was like one of those Bantam, you know, classics or something old school, uh, kind of what you would find on a rack somewhere as you're leaving a store. But uh, what I loved that she did is she went cross-cultural. So she went into like Native uh, American and other cultures where lucid dreaming is a key part of their, uh, their, their way of living. You know, it's not even exceptional. It's just what you do. Um, but uh, really cool stuff. I'm, I'm eager to hear more. Just wanted to make that note. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent. I see uh, Wild Eyes has her hands up too. Thanks, Krista. So my question is, is there a difference or what is the difference between out-of-body experience, lucid dreaming, and another term that I used to hear years ago was vivid dreams? Well, it seems like well, I don't feel totally qualified to answer this, but I'll give you my opinion, if that okay. makes sense. That's fine. Um, uh, I think vivid dreams is close to a lucid dream. And within the, within the community of lucid dreamers, it seems like there's this idea, which I agree with. And one of the authors, I actually invited him to this talk. His name is uh, Tony Zadra. And he wrote a book, When Brains Dream. And I asked him... Um, about different uh, levels of lucidity. And the way he described it to me was that uh, he he described like being lucid in a dream as if you're walking into an ocean. Sometimes your feet, you're just your toes are touching the water. Like you're you're in the world of lucidity, but you're not like head over heels in. And, and I've experienced that as you gradually get into a lucid dream, uh, you you feel like you have more understanding or you're remembering more or things are just bigger or you can uh, you feel like you have agency over other creatures or entities in the dream and a vivid dream I feel like is that early stage of, of a lucid dream now out of body experience um, you know I have had what you know if I read a definition of an out of body experience I have had those not in the dream world. Um, and I, I would say that they are different experiences from what I have experienced. They're, they're different. Um, then and maybe, maybe people have the, uh, lucid dreams that they would describe as an out-of-body experience just because of the magnitude of how strange it feels to, to be aware of things in the dream world. Um, but to me, they feel like they're different things and maybe it's just, a different doorway to get to the same point uh, or, or a, a different state of, of sleep possibly possibly yeah most okay. lucid dreams happen when you're in an REM stage so they're happening later on in the night um, and some people have hypnagogic dreams which are also very vivid um, and usually that happens if you like take a nap or if it's within like an hour or two of falling asleep if you wake up and you've got this really crazy dream but it just seemed like a um, uh, kind of like a, a, a hodgepodge or a crazy quilt of information. Uh, you're not really in control of it. It was just a very wild dream. A lot of those are the hypnagogic or the early stage of dreams versus uh, lucid, lucid dreams happen later on in, in the sleep cycle. Usually it's between the third, fourth, or fifth REM stage um, of sleeping. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sure. It's okay. I was just going to get in there on the fifth stage of sleep for you and <laughs> bring those bits in there. And also, did you, you obviously know the first kind of occurrence that they found in literature where they were talking about lucid dreaming, but obviously not under the terminology of lucid dreaming, Krista. No. Well, they've got references of Aristotle talking about it. 
So it goes back that far, at least. Obviously, it's bound to be word of mouth and oral traditions, mm. but um, it was coming into that point. So there we go, which is great. So on to anybody else with a question, because I know that obviously Krista's got sa- stages of what information she wants to go for at, along the way of this conversation. Did you want to say something, Gabe? Sorry. No, no, I'm good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just <laughs> as we go along. Yeah, I, I don't want to steal any of uh, Chris's thunder, you know. Thanks, Gabe. <laughs> in this environment, we never steal somebody else's thunder. And we're all equals in here. So, <laughs> Well, if, if I felt like someone stole my thunder, I would just steal it back. So I'm good. Um, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I did want to uh, uh, comment just on your on your comment, Paul. Uh, in in you know in the West, we don't um, we kind of we're a bit obsessive about sleep. I mean, there are people that wear devices to tell them how long they sleep and how well they sleep, and um, we we try to reduce our you know blue light exposure and people take melatonin. I mean, I think there's an understanding how important sleep is, how it affects all the body systems, how it helps recovery. There is this, this obsession with getting sleep and in tandem with it, there's an an addiction to caffeine, which just negates so much of our attempts to sleep well. But I think what's missing is yes, we do need sleep. And having, you know, spent so much time reading about lucid dreaming and lucid dreaming myself and understanding about sleep, like I'm way more conscious of getting good sleep hygiene, just like, you know, I have good oral hygiene and, and, uh, you know, good mental health hygiene. I have incorporated sleep as, as a part of my own health because it is very vital. But I think like the thing that's missing, it's like the soul of sleeping is our dream. And, um, in dreams, like they are reflective of kind of your daily reflection of yourself. And there hasn't been up until recently, uh, a push to understanding, you know, the importance of dreams and the usefulness of dreams just on an individual level, but in, in other cultures and Greece is one, uh, there, the um is there i don't know what he maybe he was the god of sleep ashlepius um but there the value of the dream world in um greek culture up to a certain point at least was was highly valued highly venerated just like in tibet and other um, native uh, american cultures um there's a sioux indian um his name's black elk um and he said something to the effect of like a dream is wasted if it's not shared they they considered you know, the information that you get from the dream world is a direct line to spirit or something other than us. And that's what keeps me interested in it is for me, I'm using this uh, for lots of different reasons, but one of them is uh, kind of a, a, you know, I call it a free and easy medicine. It's something that I can do as a self-reflection and as a connection to whatever is out there, whatever we want to call it, whatever the grander consciousness is, I feel like everybody has a direct line to it. And dreams are just one of those ways that we can connect. Um, Oh, definitely. You've also got the fact that the mystics kind of got their own name for it. And they basically call it an altered state of consciousness, which is a non-dual awareness. So you've got all different ways of it being tied in it's just fathoming how different people use the language to realize and identify it yeah it is it 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 is an altered state i mean dreaming not even just lucid dreaming but dreaming itself is an altered state um so i um i'll go into what kind of what my practice is that has been successful for me um because again i'm not I don't feel like I'm an expert, but I'm not a novice anymore. I'm kind of in that in-between stage. And because I feel like it's a useful tool, I don't feel like it's just luxurious or chic or, you know, something, you know, that hipsters are getting into. I feel like it's a like legitimate life skill that, that people can, can use if they want to. And so 
um, as like a real like quick synopsis of how I feel like you can do it. The first step is just to simply want to do it. Like if you actually want to lose a dream, that is the key in the door because what that does is that gives you the motivation to then get through and use that motivation uh, when you go to bed at night to just think um, that, if you want to, if you don't remember your dreams already, that's where you start. So when you go to bed at night, you just say to yourself, I'm going to remember my dreams in the morning. I'm going to remember them. I'm going to remember them. And it might take weeks and weeks and weeks of doing that unfruitfully before you start to remember because you have awareness and consciousness. You know, when you are going to bed, you're still awake. You have control of that. So you can control your mind. If you can remember to tell yourself when you go to bed, I'm going to remember my dreams. And then on the other end of that, when you wake up, when, you're, when your awareness returns, if you remember anything of your dreams, then you write them down. And this, this is a real key point that I, I don't know how people can begin a lucid dream journey without this one step. Uh, if you don't write them down, you're not pulling that... Um, into the waking world. And I, I view it as like pulling threads to weave the wake, the dream world into the waking world. And I know it's hard and I know it's a pain and I know it's, um, it's not the easiest thing to get into the habit of, but if you actually want to do this, it's, it's kind of a, um, like nobody gets past this point, um, successfully. Maybe some people do, but I don't think that most people would. So by writing them down in the morning, even if you only remember like one tiny thing, like I think there was something green or just the word green, writing anything down will help. It it will become cumulative. So if you do this every day, you'll you'll most likely remember more and more about the little little bits of your dream. And sometimes you'll you know you'll go in phases. Gabe is on this. Gabe and I, you know, both like tweet about our dreams. And, you know, sometimes it's like the dreams just weren't there. Sometimes they are not there. And that's what you write down. You say, I think I dreamt, but I don't remember what I dreamt. Um, Gabe, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, yeah, what Krista said about um, writing down your dreams as soon as you wake up. It's it's a very good practice. And um, I've been doing it for about a year, and I, I actually blog about it. And um, a lot of my uh, entries are kind of long and and windy, but um, I, I do uh, eventually get to the point. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely a good practice, and um, I do recommend it. Tell people your blog name. Well, my blog is at my um, my Twitter um, my Twitter account, so you can you can uh, see it there. I actually have two. I I uh, I cut it in half because I I figured uh, I was turned into page at at a certain point, so. Um, but it's um, decoding the strange at uh, blogspot.com and um, the strangeness decoded at blogspot.com. That will help people listening to podcasts afterwards. Thanks, Gabe. Um, so to to kind of finish up on the writing them down, um, you know, Gabe write like actually writes with a pen and paper, and um, I. I'm not able to do that in the middle of the night. If I wake up and my room is dark and I'm kind of still half asleep uh, and I don't have very good handwriting to begin with, I can't write stuff down uh, on a a piece of paper. What I use is because I use my phone as an alarm. I keep my phone within reach. And as soon as I wake up, even if I'm half asleep, I, I grab my phone and I have a notes app on my phone and I click it open and I just type in a few keywords. Uh, it, again, it could be, you know, the flock of sheep, you know, golden cat, my sister, um, Windsor forest, whatever, anything that I can kind of pull out. If I can kind of lightly pin them to the pay to my, uh, to that, to that notes file. Then in the morning when I wake up fully, I can open it back up and just reading those keywords will bring the dream back. And then I can write down and flesh out and elaborate more having just those tiny, tiny little um, anchors to the dream will, will help bring it back for me. Um, so 
so as a recommendation, you know, find what works for you. If you have a, if you just need a pencil or a, or a Sharpie or something to, to write down very clearly on a page, I feel like that, that those are the first two things. Cause what you're doing is creating, um, you know, full, like full strength consciousness on either side of the dream world. So you're, you're setting the intention when you go to sleep and you're writing them down when you wake up and that kind of creates, uh, uh, very clear intention and motivation on either end of it. Now, the other thing that you do, because, you know, I, I've, I've heard people talk about this, uh, and they, they make it sound so easy, like, oh, well, when, you, when you're in the dream, if you just look at words and then look away and look back, if they're moving around or they've changed, then, you know, you're dreaming. But when you're dreaming, you don't, you know, you don't feel like you're in control. You're just kind of going along with the narrative of the dream. So it's hard to remember to do that when you're dreaming. When you wake up and you've had a dream like that, you might think like, oh, I should have looked at the words. It's it's a real hard thing to remember to do when you're dreaming because you are in that altered state. So there's uh, things that you can do that are called uh, state checks or reality checks. And when you do this when you're awake. So um, I had uh, shared, and I'll share it again here. There's a thing called, um, they call it MILD. Is it uh, mnemonic induction, lucid dreaming? And what it's doing is uh, training your brain to remember on its own without, because that's the only way that you can remember, right? Is that if your brain does it for you and, uh, there, there's a whole practice of, uh, that Stephen LaBerge had recommended. Uh, let me find it and see if I can post it in there. All right. So I'm putting it in the, um, the space now. And it's a, he gives a series of, of what to do every single day for a whole week. Now I've never done this specific before. Um, what I do is, uh, I do one of three things. And the idea is that you do, you do something when you're awake. Well, like I think to myself, all right, you know, um, I am me and I want to remember my dreams and I want to engage in lucid dreaming. Um, so I will open and close my fist. Like I'm looking at my palm, my fingers are spread. I close my fingers. I do that over and over again. And as, as a, as a physical action, when I'm awake, that I then will replicate when I'm dreaming. So when I dream now, a lot of times I'm opening and closing my fists because I'm doing that in the day. So I open and close my fists and I think like, is this real? Am I dreaming? Yes, this is real. I can, I can hear my rings clinking together. I can feel my fingernails. I know that this is real. Uh, another thing to do is to look at your shadow. You can cast a shadow and move your hand around and you see that the shadow is following the movement of your hand. So it's, again, just a way to kind of check to see if this is reality or not. Um, the third one that I do that I've had most success with is looking at my reflection in the mirror. So I will look at my reflection and I'll see that it's me and my face looks like it should. Um, and I can look away and look back in the mirror and it's still the same. So it might seem a little crazy uh, to do this when you're awake like, of course, this is real. My hand is opening and closing. And of course, it's my shadow. Of course, it's my reflection. But when you do this, when you're awake, when you're in the dream world, you might come up with those same situations. So, you know, I, the mirror one has worked for me in the dreams more often than any of them. And what will happen is that I will look in the mirror in a dream and someone else's face will pop out of my neck. And I'll think like, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> and that will, that kind of bizarro, bizarro action will, will trigger me to think like, this feels weird. Oh, this is a dream. And it will help kind of, I say tipping me into lucidity because when you're in the dream, you just kind of accept it for, for being real. But when something weird like that happens, you start to get a little confused, but if, if you are tying that action with something that you did when you were conscious and aware, it helps you become conscious in the, in the dream. So 
lucid dreaming, the name doesn't really fit it because you're not clear, right? Conscious dreaming seems to fit it more. You become conscious when you are dreaming. And so one of those three actions, well, you can do, it's like a physical, tangible thing you can do in the day to then replicate at night and help you in that in-between altered state when you are not conscious. Um, so those have worked for me. The fourth thing that I will add, and then if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and put your hand up, is if you have recurring dreams, if they're nightmares or not, if you have recurring dreams, that is a gateway to get into lucid dreaming. Because the dream is recurring for one reason or another, but it's a familiar place, a familiar situation, a uh, familiar set of characters, you can use that as kind of the entry point into lucid dreaming. You know, I, uh, I, one of my lucid dream or one of my recurring dreams is pretty funny because it kind of replicates my life now. I don't like to use public toilets, right? And so in my dreams, I will have this recurring dream where I have to go use a public toilet and it's completely exposed. There's no walls. There's just a toilet in the middle of a big, you know, train station, or there's a long queue of people. And I'm so distraught because I have to use the toilet in front of people. And some of my first lucid dreams were caused by me having that, re that recurring dream where in the dream, I was like, I can't believe I'm having this dream again. I hate this dream. And having that awareness that I was dreaming helped put me into a lucid state. So if you, um, if you, have, a, if you have a recurring dream or a recurring nightmare, you can use that as the entry point uh, into uh, becoming lucid yourself. Now, if I don't see any hands up, I'll go, I'll talk a really quickly oh. just about nightmares. I was just so going to say to um, the fact that you obviously know Stephen's name he gives himself. Sorry. Okay. So you were talking obviously about Stephen LaBerge. Yeah. Yeah. And you know the name he gives himself. He calls himself a dream sailor. Oh, right. When yeah. he's talking about lucid dreaming, which I think is quite a nice one. And the fact that as you're talking about these, they can be used to actually help with like uh, post-traumatic stress disorders as well and helping yourselves out in those kind of situations. Definitely. Um, and uh, to kind of follow up on that with nightmares, uh, I, I, I recently listened to a talk by Charlie Morley and he talked about the blessing of, of a nightmare uh, while, while lucid, because, because you are given the opportunity to deal with something that, you know, you've dealt with in the, in the waking world, it's a, it's a chance to kind of confront an anxiety or, or just something that has given you trouble. And a lot of people have used it successfully in, in, in kind of tandem therapy with other things for PTSD and even insomnia. Uh, using using that situation, kind of that nightmare environment, to directly address uh, whatever the whatever the issue is. That's great. We got Ink Cipher who would like to come up and say something. Yeah, I hope everyone's blessed. I was just gonna say, we're feeling blessed. Um, I I've been having these. We'll take anything. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, we can hear you. I was just going to say, we we'll take anything. Feeling blessed, giving blessings is great. Oh, thank you, Perception. With, with, with that being said, I, I started, and I, by the way, I'm, I'm kind of just like a uh, normal to a degree. I'm, I like all this subject matter, but I did start the Gateway Experience over a year ago, and I, I still do, or actually over two years ago. But what happened was about a year ago, I started having these reoccurring dreams. So I don't want to call them a nightmare. Um, but I have these major conflict dreams, like we're, I mean, conflict, like combat. Um, so, and, and it's not somebody the other day, a friend of mine was like, Oh, you know, maybe you're in world war, you know, a past war, but it's like uh, the most recent one was, um, uh, I, I, for some reason was in the middle of choppy waters. Um, I'm swimming and a, a submarine breaches the water. I have never seen a submarine my whole life, but I wasn't scared, but I just knew that that was a fucking submarine. And I'm sorry for cursing. It's just, it was intense. Um, then 
the uh, a, a jet fighter screaming over my head. Um, I have seen in, in dreams bombs hit cities. I'm not trying to be like I'm a visionary. It's just like what you said. I'm just curious because I'm calm. I'm so calm in them and I'm not scared, but I'm also like you're saying I am intimidated at the concept of them just walking around in them, you know, and, and that's where I'm like confused in that because it, it's major conflict. And like, so there's one where I, the one where I was swimming in the water, the part that happened, that's pretty much a fantastic aspect of it. I've never seen an aircraft carrier in my face, like in my life. Uh, but I swam towards the cargo bay, I guess my brother explained to me because he's in the Navy where the, the ship, the, the, the jet elevator or whatever, I don't know the exact term of that. And that's where I, somebody like hoisted me up um, in the middle of this. So these dreams though, like what in that situation, like, what do I do? Cause I'm not scared, but I am like in the shit. Okay. Info cipher. I got your name wrong the first time around. I called you ink cipher. Um, also we try to keep the language on the kind of family friendly on this. It'd be interesting to know. No, 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 don't worry about it. You obviously came in, haven't seen anything. You're not going to obviously continue because we've you obviously know now. Um, with when you're watching these things is it like watching a film kind of dispassionate as an observer seeing the events that actually happen i want to in the beginning but now i have like oh my god it's it's a lie it's, uh, i'm there i'm there so it's it's not a, a the pov as a gamer is in it you know i'm just in the middle of these situations um and they wait. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a lot in it. I mean, there's quite a lot interesting to that point of view. Kristen might actually know something. Obviously, Gabe looks like he's got something to actually add to this. So we go to Krista first and then come back to Gabe. But it'd be interesting to see with the way that you're feeling about it that, okay, you're seeing all the information that's coming in, but you're not getting churned up by the emotional content of it, which is an angle which would be nice to investigate later. Krista? Um, I'll let Gabe go, and then I can put my two cents in. Yeah, um, info, yeah. Um, there there are a lot of times when you're um, dreaming. Um, it's not really like a nightmare, but it's like you're watching a movie. But then all of a sudden, your perspective will change, and you'll be in the action. Um, whether you're the person who is actually... Um, in the action or you're seeing someone else. So um, it, it, it'll be uh, great to see if it, it was, uh, you, you thought it was yourself or if it was someone else that you were watching. Um, sometimes you'll get like a 360 degree perspective of what's going on. You'll, you'll see that you were uh, swimming towards the uh, ship and then you see the, the, the planes overhead. Um, you, you'll be in first person uh, perspective, but then there'll be other times where you, you, you can see the whole action from around you. And uh, I'm wondering if that's something that happens to you. Well, to say my, my history, I did, uh, I had night terrors for years uh, from childhood, but I don't want to make this like too. Sorry to pause you, Fo, but it's a bit quiet when you're speaking at the moment. So it's a bit difficult to hear you. Go, can you, is it a clear that's right better. now? That's good. That's good. Great. Okay. What happens is uh, as my mom scared me as a kid with one witch mask, and that nightmare lasted for 10 years. That was definitely, I know, night terrors, you know? I know them because I experienced, had to go to a therapist. Uh, from about 16 to later, I had night, the, the sleep paralysis. But my life, I mean, I've never, I don't, I have sleep like a baby now. But um, th yeah, these dreams since then, it, it, I actually came forward talking here because it's the most different aspect of dreaming I've ever had. Um, and I, I don't, I don't want to link it too much with doing gateway all the time because I think you need to be foundationally fortified in the before jumping into subjects like that um I've, I've been sober nine years it doesn't make me better than people i just like don't feel malignancy in my heart so um that, that's what also makes this like spiritually odd is like the level of calm you know um but it, i have i have the same property in a lot of these dreams to make you guys laugh i, I like i feel like i live in new england or or in maine because it's a beautiful like kind of like just that kind of house i've been in that area like cape, the cape but I'm, I'm like, really, it's kind of overwhelming. I, I, some people that know me laugh because I, my family knows my wife washes our sheets all the time. It doesn't smell or nothing. I'm not like, out of, I mean, I'm very healthy. I sweat consistently only in my sleep. I don't even sweat in jujitsu. 
it's these dreams. I'm just like gone uh, the best way I could say it. So I'm really happy for this group and finding this today. No, it's great that you actually did. I mean, again, what I will say to you is kind of basically the public service announcement. If you're interested in consciousness in any kind of way, we kind of have topics of whether it be text-based or have these audio chats on different subjects and bring people in to discuss it, whether they're just people with questions or all the way through to different research types. And when you look in the bio, you'll find that we do have, obviously, a link tree URL, which will give you access to the podcast for previous ones where we had round tables like this discussing other subjects like Paranormal Blip did one with us who's a podcast who's here, which is Pete, talking about reincarnation again with also Anthony Peake, who is a research uh, into consciousness borderline areas. And again, we got Natural Born Alchemist who does really good ones on culture, psychedelics, and how it should be used. We also have other people who are sensitives, and also we have authors in the room like Mike Ferrito. And uh, just spotting anybody else, we've got obviously continuing the conversation, which is T Rex Orphia in here. And Tamara Dick has just turned up, which is good. So if you like those kind of things and want to come in and out or just swap articles with us or just follow these kind of people and then sample their interests and passions feel free uh, thank you guys so well, if there's any um, more questions for Krista <laughs> she's going to go next otherwise I'll, I'll just trip over that particular area before we do that can I just say hello to Pete if he can say hello And Pete, if you can't say, oh, you, you can't talk at the moment. Okay, right, Mike. Oh, thank you. Oh, Krista, just one quick question. Uh, how how often do you uh, do you lucid dream? Is it every night, or is it do you just kind of wait for the bird to fly in the window? Um, I um, I'm able to lucid dream nearly whenever I want to now, mm -hmm. and I I don't do it um, that frequently because uh, part of Part of lucid dreaming is that you don't really get a good full night's rest. And uh, of all the benefits that I think it has, that's the number one risk, aside from just, like I said, being annoying and talking to your loved ones about it too much, <laughs> is, um, is you actually don't, you don't rest very deeply and mm -hmm. you need rest, um, you need sleep. So um, if I... Um, if I average it, I would say maybe two or three nights a week, I'll have some sort of a lucid dream, unless I'm unless I'm working on a specific uh, kind of story or motivation when I go to bed, um, because I do have little missions that I like to go on when I lucid dream. If I'm kind of in that narrative and that story, then I'll do it more. But um, I also just kind of let it come and go. Um, I don't get too hung up if I don't have one, um, mm. just because I feel like if you try so hard, you can kind of um, – trick your mind to not having it happen mm. and just have to you have to just kind of be accepting of whether dreams you know come and go um gabe and i talk about this on twitter just you know sometimes they come and sometimes they don't and you just have to accept accept them for um what they are um gabe if you want to go and then um oh, info, just quickly. I'll, I'll follow up just of of your your dream experience after gabe pipes just in. quick quickly i wanted to ask you krista do you use it as problem solving you're lucid dreaming. Oh, definitely, for sure. Because otherwise, that's also another one that other people should be aware of if they've not investigated that area. Yeah, I just I just wanted to add about um, the lucid dreaming. Yes, it does interrupt your sleep. So um, yeah, I, I would liken it to having a, a, a baby in the house. You know, you're going to be up all night if you're a lucid dreamer. Um, um, the frequency of, of my uh, awakenings, I could have lucid dreams at any point at, at, at night. Um, and I wake up at the oddest hours. So it'll be like every hour on the hour or every half hour. And I, I can I can remember a dream. So it is very tiring. And I, I just drop into lucid dreams. I don't try to do them anymore. But um, yeah, it's it, it, it can be exhaustive. And um, that's that's my next trick is learning how to shut them off but I'll, I'll turn it back over it looks like there's a hand up michael yeah. is that your name it's peaceful yeah yeah peaceful 
or, or Michael, either way. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, I, I'm just coming. In uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, guys. I just couldn't find the mute button. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. Thank okay. you. That's okay, Mike. Yeah, I was. I was also sorry. Peaceful. Yes, <laughs> Your audio is a bit low at the moment. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if um, the the motive behind it or or doing it are is it to control the narrative of what's going on, um, and or or does that kind of go along with getting answers to questions or problem solving? Um, yeah, I think for me, um, it's never been about controlling the whole dream. And, you know, when some people s describe lucid dreaming, they'll say like, oh, you, you know, you're in control of everything. And I don't think that's true. Um, just because you're, you're not, you're not painting the backdrop, you're not creating the entire environment consciously when you're lucid, you're, you're really in control of your own actions. And, um, you know, sometimes I've been able to freeze a scene, kind of like put my hand up and just freeze all the characters and then literally just walk off the stage into another um, scenario. So for me, it's not a matter of controlling the whole narrative, but um, and this will kind of answer um, InfoCypher's uh, questions about his own dreams, because I do I've had similar dreams uh where things are um, like full of violence, full of, uh, you know, big weaponry and machinery. And, you know, I'm a very um, uh, gentle and calm and stable and grounded person. It's out, it's out of my wheelhouse to kind of be in a situation of um, lots of death and violence and, and um, you know, like kind of horrific scenes. But, um if I'm in a situation like that and before I began lucid dreaming, I would have considered those nightmares because I would just be vulnerable to the situation of the narrative. And now because my relationship with what I consider a nightmare has changed because of my uh, actions in lucid dreaming, I feel like I'm taking responsibility and ownership and control of just myself. And, uh, and then uh, reverberating out from me, I get to control other situations so, um, InfoCypher, what, what I would say is when you ask, like, why are you having these dreams? It's hard, uh, it's hard for anyone, uh, to answer that for you without context of what's going on around, around you outside of that. And that's why I think that journaling is helpful because if you can write down those situations, you yourself might be able to recognize patterns in those dreams outside of the fact that they're vivid or they or they're threatening or they're violent or they raise your emotions um, you you might be able to to find um, some symbolism in that but also I think that they can be empowering because think about it like if you're in that situation and you're staying calm under all of this really wild uh, you know world upending craziness to me that tell if I had that dream I would wake up and think, even if it's subconsciously, like I can handle some pretty big stuff. If I handled that, that's just my, my own psyche telling me that I'm capable of handling um, some pretty big situations. You don't have to translate it literally, but it can be a symbol of you being a calm in a storm or, you know, that you could be a, a, a lifeline to other people that are going through big stuff because you're able to, to keep a, a calm head in the midst of it. Okay, thank you. I mean, I find this fascinating because of the way that you've been discussing things. When I was small, and we're talking probably five or seven, I had this dream. Just I couldn't see me. I could see what was going on around. So it was kind of a Viking village all getting kind of massacred and all kinds of things going on blood-wise. But at that point within it, something kind of said, don't worry, it's only a dream. You're watching it. So I didn't kind of have like, nightmare terrors with it. Then I've had loads of kind of odd dreams throughout my life that have had been peculiar, but there's always been part of me when it's been a, an odd situation, it's gone, no, don't worry, you're just dreaming and kind of tells you that you're the observer while you're in it and it doesn't get to be a problem. And maybe that is a form of lucid dreaming or not, because obviously the subconscious is kind of kicking in or the other part of higher consciousness that we always talk about. 
but it'd be fun to track down to see what that really is. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, Krista, before we go to obviously paranormal. No, that's good. Paranormal. Paranormal blip haven't been able to speak hello, to you since hello. prior to Christmas. Who are you? Yeah, how are you doing? You okay? Good to uh, hear you all. Good to hear you all. So listen, good to thank see you, you back. Very, good to see you back. Good to see you all back. Um, listen, Paul, thanks very much for sectioning up the uh, four-hour um, reincarnation talk that we did uh, quite a while ago now, isn't it? And you've been parceling them out. Back so in November. Parts one and two. That's right, back in November, yeah. Parts got three and four and done as well. Already, I got oh, three, three and four ready to drop. Oh, oh, yeah, but they're not dropped yet, though, no? Not yet, no. Not yet, no. Okay, so that's... Give people that's a chance to it. listen to something. <laughs> um, but thank you, though. I just want to formally put on the record, because this is recording, your thanks for, for doing that. And, oh, that's very um, kind of you. Yeah, it was right. just a great session. We're going to have more of those along the way in the future. It was really good, wasn't it? It's nice to hear it back, actually. Um, so Krista, thank you very much. This is really fascinating um, area. It's really fascinating. I've got a question regarding a um, – there's a, there's a place that I often go to, which I've spoken about on these spaces before, which is a kind of version of London that isn't really anything like London, really. But um, I kind of repeatedly go there in my dreams. Uh, I can't really remember the last time. It was quite a while ago, the last time I went there. But through my life, I've gone there, I mean, you know, countless times, hundreds of times. And I wonder, do you, do you, can you go back to a place? And also, quite similar to the question that was just asked, in that can you, can you continue a, a narrative, even if you don't have control over every aspect, is it possible to kind of stop? So there's two questions here. One is about a place, pretending to a place. And the next question is about can you uh, almost kind of stop a dream as if it's, you know, the end of a chapter and then kind of start back up, start the same dream essentially, back up again later on. There you go. There's a couple of questions. <laughs> Those are great. Um, yeah, to answer your second question first, uh, usually uh, I can repeat or I can kind of dive back into a dream if I wake up in between. Um, so that, that is one thing that, that people can, can do if they wake up out of a dream and they're kind of half awake, they can write down what they remember from that dream. And if you stay awake for a few minutes and you think about that dream and you keep thinking about it as you fall asleep, if you're able to fall asleep again, which I'm aware that I, I, I get, I fall asleep pretty easily. I have pretty good sleep um, ability. So I'm able to kind of wake up in the middle of the night and fall back asleep within minutes. So I will pull that thread back in and I will keep the dream going and it, it will shift a little bit, but the majority of the, um, the landscape and the characters and the animals, because animals play more of a uh, present role in my dream than other humans do for me. Um, so I'm able to continue dream narratives that way. Sometimes, and I would do this before I did lucid dreaming, is I would not like what I was dreaming about, usually because it was frightening, I felt threatened, it was scary. I would wake up and I would just say to myself, like, I'm done with that dream, and I would go back to sleep within the dream, but it would be less frightening. Um, and then the first question you asked about places, and yes, uh, there there is, um, there have been places that I have returned to in my dreams since I was a kid. And the, the, the motivation when I started lucid dreaming or started the practice to try to lucid dream, I, I had this recurring dream of being in this amazing house. And I knew that it was my house, but I hadn't been there for a long time or someone else had moved in and it was my job to kind of scoot them out. Um, and I really loved the feeling in the dream when I was in that house because I felt truly home. And uh, as a pretty ambitious practice, when I began lucid dreaming, I was telling myself when I go to bed, I would say, when you get to the house in the dream, you'll reach and feel for your backpack on your shoulder. And you'll take the backpack off and you'll 
unpack it in the middle of the house as a symbol to claim that it's yours. And I, I've never done that. <laughs> Once I get into that house, now that I lucid dream, I don't care about the bag. I'm doing other things. I'm, I'm exploring whatever the narrative is presenting. So I do dream about that house and it will slightly shift a little bit, but for the most part, the feeling, the effects around it are similar where I know the place, even if it looks slightly different. And then throughout my life, I've dreamt about um, the neighborhood that I grew up in and I grew up in a church family. So I would dream about the church property and I, and most of my dreams growing up were um, the the in-between stage, literally the roads that connected my family home to my church home. So that would kind of be this one and it would slightly shift, but uh, I don't know what the meanings of that or what the meaning of that is, why you would dream about a place that doesn't quite exist in the real world. It might just be your idealization of a place that you like and it's your kind of playground, your dream playground that you create. I'm not saying that it, it isn't also, um, you know, something more metaphysical, something kind of beyond uh, scientific explanation, because I think that dreams have the capacity to teach us things that we don't understand or can't validate yet scientifically. But for me, it, it seems like it's a representation of something that your mind is creating as like a safe and wonderful playground for you just to play within within the dreams. Yeah, definitely. If I could just quickly re reply, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the everything about that um, kind of fictional London that I've made up makes sense to me on a kind of emotional level, you know, and a lot of it is, um, you know, more or less replicating actual streets and neighbourhoods and areas of London, but there's a kind of jumble to it, which is, you know, which doesn't exist in the real world. But yeah, I, I totally... Um, agree with you um about that thank you really beautiful beautifully articulated answers <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> gabe i saw your hand was up do you want to chime in uh, hang on one second sheena oh, I was before gabe i know these icons don't always turn up at the same time on both of our screens uh thank you i was just going to say that I have had similar experiences to Krista. I've been lucid dreaming since I was a child. Um, it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized that I was lucid dreaming. I, I didn't know what the dreams were. So as a child, um, quite often I would have what I consider to be frightening experiences in the dreams. And then I came to understand as an adult um, that I was lucid dreaming. And for me, it's just as real as being awake. I actually have to check to see if I'm dreaming by, by looking at the clock or a, a digital clock or trying to flick on an elect a light because electricity doesn't work well when you're lucid dreaming if you look at a digital clock the numbers will be flickering they won't be right or if you try to turn on a light switch the light won't come on um and that's quite often how i know whether i'm awake or asleep because the the dreams nowadays now that i'm older um you know they they tend to start off taking place in my home and and i i genuinely think that i'm awake walking around my home but once i realize that i am dreaming uh then yes i can control the dream to a very large degree i can decide i want to do this or i want to do that and and i Personally, I waste the lucid dreams a lot of the times. I do stupid things like flying, and then I, and then I get scared because I've gone too high, and I think I'm going to crash land. I mean, I I I live it as if I was fully awake. Um, like Krista, I can return to the same dream um, if I if I have a dream um, that I want to delve back into. I I can. Um, and, and I find your recurrent dream interesting because I've had a recurrent dream since probably, probably puberty. Now, I've never 
never in my life been to India. But in this recurrent dream, I'm in India. Um, I have a mother and two sisters. And every time I see them, I know that this is my mother. I know these are my two sisters. I know their names. I know who they are. Um, and I'm being forced into a marriage that I don't want. And, and I've had that dream several times over the years since puberty. I don't get it as often now, nowadays. Um, but I got that over and over and over again. And it's always puzzled me because, you know, I'm seeing people in my dreams that are not representative of anyone that I know in reality. And yet in the dreams, I know who they are. I know them very well. Um, I'm seeing a home that I've never seen and a country that I've never, ever seen at all in reality. Yet in the dream, in this recurrent dream, it's very, very real as if I'm, you know, I'm living there in that moment. So I, I find that interesting. So, yeah, I was I was just going to say that, yes, to, to some extent you can control the dreams. You can decide, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do the other, and you can guide it. Um, I'm, I'm yeah, like I said, I'm not as... Um, Probably not as evolved as Krista. I don't tend to use it for problem solving. I tend to use it for sheer, just sheer experience. And with that, I'll shut up and let Gabe speak. Before that, I'm going to get to quickly ask you a quick question, Sheena. What was the main area that gave you more information about your lucid dreaming? Was it books, a person, or talking to another person that gave you the insight that you were doing this? It was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with mind machines. They are machines that, mind labs, they're machines that you can use um, light and sound in order to entrain your brain waves so that you can put yourself into a beta state or uh, a theta state, which is the most common for dreams. Um, I had got interested in these machines, and the machines led me to a particular company. And that company, as well as selling these particular machines, also um, had a lot... They, they had, like, a an eye mask that would enable you to tell when you were lucid dreaming because it, it sort of monitored your eyes when you were in REM and when it noted your eyes were in REM, you would get little red, red lights flash and a very um, pale alarm. But yeah, it was when I started interacting with that company and seeing their products and reading some of their books that I realized these dreams that I've been having my entire life, that they're, they're lucid dreams, and I can find a way to tap into knowing when I'm having one and controlling it. Okay, that's great, because I've just obviously done a quick search while we've been talking on Mind Machines and found the website howtolucid.com, and it looks like it's discussing those particular types. I'm not sure if you know about the Luthia light as well. Which no, is called I, Lucia Light Number Three. I, I I interacted with a company called Life Tools myself, but this was this was years and years and years ago, um, and I now um, interact directly with the company in the US that supplied them initially. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, that's interesting. Okay, Gabe, sorry for butting in there, but I just needed to figure out how people are understanding what they're going through. No, no, that, that that's okay. Um, yeah, I was just going to speak to what a paranormal blip was, uh, uh, the question he had asked about uh, reinsertion into dreams. Um, um, there are times when um, it, it'll just happen automatically. Um, um, there is a, there is uh, uh, different uh, techniques like Krista uh, mentioned that you, you can actually get back into the same dream, but um, oftentimes it'll be at a different perspective and, 
I think it's the realization that you're in that same uh, area that will bring your consciousness forward and, and you'll uh, realize that you're there. Um, my other um, comment was um, the different locations. Um, uh, you mentioned London and I've never been to London myself. I've been in the United States forever and um, I've been in several areas in London um, by the river, by in the tube, like you would call the subway here in the United States um, in the streets. So it's, it's just like one of the locations that I'll be in. And I've been in, uh, I don't know if uh, in some mansions in, in uh, London. So uh, it, 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 when when you get to different areas that um, um, that you don't know, they will they will spark your uh, your consciousness to come in, and you'll be like, "Wow, wait a minute, I'm in I'm in London again." You'll be thinking that in your mind while you're dreaming. You say, "Wow, I'm in London," or you might end up in Chicago or or in Brazil, which has happened to me. I've actually been to Africa that I've never been before. So it's, you know, these locations will pop up and, and they do bring your consciousness forward and I'll just, uh, I'll kick it back. Well, um, I wanted to, uh, is it Ellie? Is it shining one? Is that who? Sheena. So, Sheena. You can call me Shana. Shana. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you speak, it it reminds me of kind of the 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 area of of using dreams and lucid dreams that uh, I feel is kind of what motivates me to continue learning about uh, to to continue continue on the lucid dream journey and just to learn more about it because you know there are there's lots that you can read about you know what's happening in the brain when you are dreaming and you're asleep and and, um, you know, we can talk about symbols in dreams, um, but there's, there's facets of dreamings that, that aren't explained and they don't make sense in kind of the traditional um, scientific understanding of what's going on in our brain. Uh, you know, in this Perceptions Today community, we have mentioned before, you know, if consciousness is lo located just in the brain or is it a receiver of information from elsewhere, um, and I'll, you know, just leave elsewhere to be open to interpretation. But when I hear you talk about dreams like that, I mean, some people immediately go to past lives. Some people immediately go to parallel universe. Um, but, you know, having dreams like that, that um, you can't really reconcile, you can't replace a character in your real life with someone in the dream I feel like it just, it to me, it leaves me open to, to understanding connections to um, situations that aren't quite explained uh, uh, just within our, within our modern um, understanding of dreams. Estevo? Hello. Hi. Uh, um, maybe, maybe I'm asking a similar question as someone else already did. Um, do you think this could have some sort of um not sure if this is the right word some sort of prophetic value as in you know there are people who um who who use tarot cards to to get insight in in their present the past the future uh, other people use astrology um look at the planets the stars all that sort of thing then i've been in other spaces where people are actually channeling and somehow have or claim to have uh, information coming through to them about other people in that space, but this being just something for yourself, do you think that it will provide a sort of a guide for for yourself in, in life, in, you know, in, uh, yeah, something f for your own benefit? Yeah, I, I do think it will in the same way that um, meditation in, in the day helps kind of ground you and center you and helps your, your spirit and your mind and your psyche and <clears throat> whatever kind of come to a stillness. And when you're in that stillness, I feel like you can work things out. And, and lucid dreaming in a way is having a stillness in the dream world. So it is like a meditative state within the dream world 
that is mimicked with having um, s- stillness and meditation and mindfulness in the waking world. So I, f- I feel like there's benefits to that of just um, being being still enough to listen to anything that is maybe coming through. Now, I was going to mention prophetic dreams because when, you know, when I hear Shana talk about this dream of, you know, having another life in India, you know, what does that mean for her? Does, is, is that a past life? Like I remember, you know, you had that dream um, mentioned, you know, many spaces ago about um, kind of a barbecue and someone just, really quickly threw out that, oh, it must have been a past life. That's some people's kind of knee-jerk reaction to something that's so outside of their every day that it must be something that was a past life. And I, that's not my first reaction, but I feel like it, it could be a possibility. If you're going to be open to understanding and interpreting dreams, past life is a channel to view, as are why people have prophetic dreams, because they do happen. Um, I was... I was looking up, I was trying to find the name of that town in Wales that um, all those children were killed from the coal disaster, Aberfan Aberfan in Wales in the 60s. And before it happened, some of the children that were killed had dreams about dying the way that they did. And there's no scientific explanation of why you would have a dream like that before you died as a child. It just, uh, it doesn't quite make sense. So to me that they're similar uh, areas to look at dream dream work is why people have dreams that become that you learn later on become prophetic now for me I have pretty wild dreams and I I don't take them all with the same weight so some dreams I will wake up and I'll have a sense like usually it's a foreboding that something's not good and I will pay attention to that more than others because some of them just feel like they're just wild dreams but some of them do feel there's a gut intuitive feeling that I need to pay attention usually it's about a person uh just as a as a personal answer I I don't use dreams to guide me to take one action or the other I kind of use them as uh, a meditative stillness to just observe my own consciousness whenever I can and uh, with me and my my dream journaling hopefully help me find patterns that maybe I'll be able to use in the future um, or not. Um, but I'm not, I don't feel called to use it as uh, like a soothsayer or to use it to help um, take specific actions, if that makes sense. It does. And you were right about the Aberfan disaster, which was 21st of October, 1966. For those yeah, and I think the Titanic, the Titanic too had a few people that, um, that there were people that had documented dreams before and that they were killed on the Titanic. Um, so I, I think that there's, there's documents out there. It's not just, um, not just hearsay. Like there, there are, are, are things that are, um, you know, that are time stamped basically that there would be no way that a child could know that they were going to die in the way that they did. And no. I don't know whose hand went up first. Sheena is next then natural born alchemist. I have had prophetic dreams three times that I can be sure of, um, but I didn't recognize them as prophetic dreams. Um, There was only one that I thought might be a prophetic dream. The first one was um, when I was very, very young. I, I, I had a dream about a girl, and then several years later, Uh, I moved to a different country. I befriended this girl, um, and we were friends for some time. And one day we were just sat together, and she turned her head in a certain way. And in that instant that she turned her head, I immediately recognized that she was the girl that I had dreamt of years previously. Um, The second time was... Um, an instance where I dreamt of the number 19. It kept reappearing in a dream over and over and over again. And just by sheer coincidence, my partner, um, the following evening, suggested we go to a casino. Now, this was completely unexpected, and we weren't casino goers. I mean, this this was the kind of thing that, you know, 
might occur once every five years. Um, Can I just quickly butt in and ask what casino um, that you were going to? Was it Uh, UK based or outside of the country? Yes, yes, it was UK based. It was UK Ah. based. So we went to this casino and he wanted to play blackjack and he, he kind of gave me 20 pounds and said, you know, go keep yourself entertained. So I went to the roulette wheel and I kept playing the number 19 and it kept coming up and I kept raking it in. And it wasn't long before he came over and said to me, I've run out of money, let's go. And I was like, no, no, I'm not ready to go. And he said, well, I've run out of money. And I said, here you go. And I I shoved him some, you know, some chips that he could cash in for a couple of hundred pounds. And and he carried on. Now, normally, I mean, when I was a kid, my parents worked casinos. And, and you know, you, you don't ever go into a casino and spend more money than you can afford to lose because the odds are always in the favour of the house. You know, that they're, they're counting on the idea that you will win a bit and then you'll get caught up in this idea of a winning streak and lose everything. So you don't ever go into a casino with the idea of I'm going to win. But But I won an awful lot of money that night. And I think... You know, the, the guy tending the roulette table seemed quite shocked. Um, and I could see him looking sideways at me, like, have you fixed this in some way? And I hadn't, but I just kept um, just kept winning. Uh, the third time around, and again, I didn't know at all that it was a prophetic dream. I was keeping dream diaries, and I would suggest that I, I no longer have the kind of dedication or diligence to do it, but I would suggest that if you're into um, the idea of prophetic dreaming, keep a dream diary, because at that time I was living in the UK and so were my parents. Um, and I had a dream that I wrote down in my dream diary and in this dream, um, It was something to do with uh, my parents were in the States. Um, One of them had returned to Britain. I I noted that a check had been written in US dollars. um, And and that was how I surmised that that they were in the States because a check had been written in US dollars. And I made note of a visit to the dentist as well. And then within a couple of years, my parents um, did move back over to the States. And then a couple of years after that, my mother came back to England with the um, sole intention of seeing a dentist because her dental work was cheaper in England than it was in the States. So she came, came over to England just to have the dental work done. And I didn't connect it at all. And for some coincidence, we ended up going through the dream diaries together. And and she, you know, she read what I'd written and, and it was spot on. Um, it was it was it was spot on. If we hadn't been looking at those diaries together, I would not have never connected the dots myself. I didn't remember the dream. Um, but yeah, it was it was pretty spot on. So if you're interested in prophetic dreaming, I would suggest you keep dream diaries, write down your dreams and every now and again, revisit them because it is interesting. You know, I, I can't explain it. And that's that's I mean, I tend to, you know, Krista said the question is, is the mind a receiver. I tend to think it's both. I tend to think it's it's both a transmitter and a receiver. Um, somebody yeah, else said that. Well, I was going to say on that thought, you've also got the fact that you could have it as an interference pattern that the signals out there comes in and interacts with the organic and produces something else rather than the pure signal that it is coming in, which is another wonderful topic to go on to. I know Natural Born Alchemist is next, and then Azure, and I. I think that's right, Krista. I think you can see those two. Yeah. Excellent. Alex, oh, by the way, anyone who's new, go look at Natural Born Alchemist podcast. You'll like the facts on culture and, again, on psychedelics and also philosophy and his other viewpoints. 
And again, go look at Mike Frito, who's an author here as well. He's got his website, mikefrito.com, worthwhile seeing. Go see T-Rex. I always can't see that last part of yours. Euphoria, and again, miss pronounced but he does continuing the conversation podcast always worthwhile and discord server which we've plugged i'm gonna plug paranormal blip and go and see his paranormal podcast as well and just basically everybody else in here and over to alex uh, thanks uh, it's a very good topic and space and uh, <clears throat> um, just quickly my my wife has prof- Prophetic dreams all the time, uh, but uh, I can't really speak for her, so I don't really know how it works. But uh, that that wasn't what I was going to talk about. Uh, the people were talking about past lives and that, and you might be dreaming that. But uh, from my experience, I often dream that I am somebody else. Uh, sometimes in other worlds as well, like other planets or places I don't really know. And, uh, oh, I'm just quickly on that one, Alex. At some point, we must get you talking to Maren Dahl, who's listening, because he gets that kind of sense when he's having his temporal lobe epilepsy events of being taken to other places as well, yes, as you talk about being on other planets. Yeah, that's interesting. And But not only that you're in another body, that you're also uh, a different kind of person, like... Uh, you have different uh, moral ideas or, you know, like you are somebody else, you know. Uh, So I'm thinking like, uh, because I view reality as a dream. So when you're dreaming, it's only a dream within a dream. Uh, And if the universe is a bunch of dreams within dreams, then it would be very easy to actually, maybe it's not past life. Maybe it's that you like uh, go into other people's lives uh, either while they're sleeping or while they're awake uh, and it's um, it's very fluid it's like a ham radio you know you can switch channels so it's sending a, like uh, I don't know her name but she said recently or just now that the brain is sending and receiving so you're sending and receiving. Yeah. You're, you're sending and receiving at the same time so it just basically it's all a garbled mess uh, and that's so that could be it that uh Uh, it's all just uh, jumping around into different dreams and that and then when you die it just continues like that there's a happy point isn't there alex (laughs) some point along that way we get another adventure hopefully with the next (laughs) transition which would be great yeah yeah, unless you manage to escape the samsara you know oh definitely azure good evening hello all um krista just wanted to ask excuse me um is there anything that triggers your lucid dreaming because like i can go through phases where i can dream quite a lot or don't dream at all or i have dreamt and i can't remember so is there anything specifically that can trigger your lucid dreams yeah so um early at the very beginning of this call which i don't think you were you were on there, there are things that I do, um, in the waking world that then will, because I do them with such repetition when I'm awake, will replicate in the dream. So the ones that work for me is, uh, to open and close my fists. So I'll open my fingers wide, look at my palm, close my fingers in like I'm balling up my fists and do that over and over. And when I'm doing that, I kind of use that as a reminder of like, is this real? Am I dreaming? Is this real life? And I do that throughout the day. There was a, a movie uh, called Inception, and it was uh, a lot about lucid dreaming. And what they would do is spin a top, and you know they would look at the top, and if the top never tipped over, you know it should tip over in real life. And so that would be kind of their their yeah. uh, reality check to know. So yeah. I'll, I'll do the open and close of the fist. I'll, I'll look at my shadow. If I cast a shadow, I'll make sure that I'm in control of the shadow. If the shadow is doing something that I'm not doing, that will be a trigger. Um, but the one that I've used the most um, successfully in lucid dreaming is looking at my own reflection. Right. So if I see water or a mirror, I'll look at my own reflection and then I'll look away and look back. And if I'm 
not doing when I should be doing, or if my face starts to mutate or other people come out of me, it's such a bizarre, shocking thing in the dream that I know I'm dreaming. And that will help kind of tip me into, oh, it's a dream. I get to do, you know, whatever I want, or I get to do this specific thing. Mm. I, you know, it, those are the three things that I, that I use. And also, um, if you have a recurring dream, Mm-hmm. You can use that as the the doorway to walk through. If you, if it's a familiar dream to you, sometimes that in itself can be a trigger to help realize, oh, I've been here before. I must be dreaming. So those are those are some that I've used. Yeah, um, because yeah, Inception's obviously a great film. Um, I've I've seen that, and um, it does take quite a lot to get your head around. So obviously, if that's how you're, you know, like with the spinning top and everything. Um, it, it, it sounds as if like, um, what would, um, reoccurrent dreams mean if you kept having reoccurrent dreams? Is, is that a meaning for anything? Well, for me, I have, I'll have reoccurring dreams of just being in the same um, building or, um, I'll have a reoccurring dream where I'm having to get from one place to another. Um, I'll have, uh, I had a reoccurring dream um, for a long time. I, I had a, a boss that was particularly difficult and the business that we all worked for just collapsed. And I was very happy to not have that job anymore because mm-hmm. the relationship with the, with the boss was pretty volatile. Right. But when I, when I left that job, I had a recurring dream where I would wake up and realize I still worked for her and I would have to quit over and over and over. And it would just be this recurring dream. Um, in high school, I had a dream where I had to break up with my high school boyfriend over and over and over. So having, having almost like stressful situations that I had to reevaluate would be a recurring dream. Sometimes it's just being in, um, a really lovely place. Like I, my, one of my recurring dreams that I enjoy is being in like the perfect home, which is my home. And it's the best of everything that I've ever wanted in one spot. So having kind of a recurring landscape or character, usually the characters are somebody that I just have some stuff in the real world or the waking world to work out. Um, yeah. So it, it almost like your dreams can warn you of maybe what's to come possibly. Yeah, I also think that, you know, when you have difficult dreams, um, intense dreams, uh, you know, a lot of us, even if you're not in school anymore, you might still have a dream where you show up and you're in school and you haven't studied and you have to take a test. It's a very common dream, even after you're out of school age. And I think that the reason you have those dreams is, um, you know, whatever outcome happens in the dream, you get to wake up and you get to think, oh, you know, that was kind of the worst case scenario, but it, it, it's not what's happening in my waking life. So it, it helps kind of give you a little bit of confidence. Also, um, Oh, I almost got you... in there. Oh, you go ahead, <laughs> I saw a pause. I saw a pause. I was just going to say for Azure, there's also some other areas. So for example, if you're going through things in your life and they are recurrent but in a frustrating kind of way some of the dreams can also be like unmet needs that might be going on areas of frustration and again issues from the past which haven't been addressed which is a nice ambiguous area but Krista over to you thanks Krista to help our research and understanding leave perceptions today's podcast reviews subscribe to the podcast along with the other social media accounts and share come and join our live events That way we can get together and have thoughtful discussions along with advancing our understanding of concepts as we go along.